Tonight, uh, it's no April Fool's joke that Buzzards Bay is threatened by serious levels of nitrogen pollution, uh, and that that's a threat to all marine life, large and small. And if you consider a scale of 1 to 100, where uh, 100 is if the bay were just totally perfect and pristine, the coalition um, did a study in 2011 showing that the bay is only at 45 in terms of health. So in other words, the bay is less than 50% pristine. And a lot of that is because of nitrogen pollution. And um, nitrogen pollution, as many of you know, really the bulk of it is being caused by old septic tanks and um, really passe um, treatment facilities. So um, basically, the nitrogen, <laughs> I've learned a lot putting this together, but nitrogen is coming from all of us. Um, you know, I hate to say it, but it's people pee. <laughs> Sorry, but <laughs> it's, um, you know, we it goes into um, our septic tanks from the septic tank. It goes into leaching field from the leaching field. It goes into the groundwater. And because we're in a watershed, all that comes right out into the bay, and that's nitrogen. And um, somehow, not, our old facilities are just too poor to cl clean it up. But the good news is that um, with the right methods employed, nitrogen pollution really can be significant improved and um, we should be able to get the bay to um, a much more healthy state if we do what the, the speakers tonight tell us to do. So the first speaker is Guy Campina. He's director of, of water pollution control uh, for the Wareham wastewater treatment facility. He will be speaking with uh, Russell Cleek Cle Cle Camp, excuse me, Cleek Lamp, say it 10 times, right? <laughs> Who's a consultant to the, t at the town of Wareham. And together they will tell us about innovative methods devoted to improving the treatment of wastewater and projects addressing nitrogen reduction, including the construction of new facilities. Um, Eric Turkington um, is the chairman of the Falmouth Water Quality Management Committee. And Eric will discuss the problems of cesspools and septic leaching fields leaching excess nitrogen into the estuaries. And he'll describe a project designed to supplement or replace these older methods with innovative nitrogen reducing systems. Um, Joe Costa is executive director of the Buzzards Bay National Estuary Program. And Joe's going to um, address the problem of stormwater excess nitrogen and their effects on marine life, as well as promising projects underway to um, improve all that. And our last speaker is Rachel uh, Chikuba. Where's Rachel? There you are. And she's a science director at the Buzzards Bay Coalition. She'll be reviewing the problem of fertilizer-related nutrients that are released from cranberry bogs and how the Buzzards Bay Coalition and Cranberry Industry are working together to determine how these nutrients, which can add to the Bay's problem of nitrogen, might be reduced. Um, they're each going to talk 15 minutes, and then we're going to have a Q&A. And I just really want to thank the speakers for coming tonight. Uh, some of them drove a distance. So thank you for being here. Um, so we're starting with Guy. Well, he's doing that. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. <clears throat> I want to give a quick um, story. Uh, I guess it all comes down to belief, truth. Um, at one time, I was chairman of the Board of Health and uh, the Buzzers Bay Coalition. Uh, Corinne Peterson, I remember her, and Joe Costa came to my meeting. And they were talking about nitrogen, pollution. And I said to them, until I get real numbers, I am not going to do anything. And the reason was is because I didn't have the facts, I didn't have the belief, and I wasn't willing to do something on something I wasn't so sure of. So if nothing else tonight, I, I want you all to see what's really going on, um, listen to the truth of what's going on, because every single one of us 
contributes, and where every single one of us can be part of the solution. Um, I work for the town of Warham, um, and I've been there for a few years. And uh, part of my responsibility is to, is to treat um, wastewater. Um, and so that's what we do. Um, Warham is a, is a community I really love. I was raised there, born there. Um, we have 52 miles of shoreline. Um, so that means that we have land meeting water. Um, and we have an abundancy of, wall, of, 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 of uh, natural resources. When I was a kid, I remember walking in Onset Harbor and flounder would swim around my feet. That's fact. I remember grabbing the flounder. I remember eating scallops till they came out of my ears. They were so abundant. So today, that's not such the truth. And in the past few years, that's not such the truth. So I asked myself, why did they leave? And so when you don't make somebody welcome, they tend to leave. So we're polluting and not realizing what we're really doing to the environment. In 1990, I wanted 98, 95, the town of Warham took the ambitious approach to redo their wastewater treatment facility to a biological nutrient removal. And it went online approximately 2005. We've sewered 10 areas of the community um, that were deemed through the DEP, through the Board of Health and other members that were the most critical areas on the water that needed to be addressed, affecting the Warham River watershed and of course the Wee Antic. Um, so there are a lot of good people have started something that I have the privilege of continuing to do. So I'm really truly blessed and I, and I mean that sincerely. I want to thank the people in front of me that uh, took the initiative. Um, but something that I pride myself in is thinking outside of the box. Sometimes we get set, and I hear too much past practices, that's why we do things, and sometimes you gotta get past that. So in Warham, we do some things that are innovative. One of the things is this grant program, and, and Russ will talk about that, but I wanna talk about a couple of stupid things, is, is I, it, people come to, but uh, uh, regionalization. We're looking now to regionalize. We're trying to get other communities involved, pool our monies, pool our efforts, um, and, and we can share this common problem and together we can solve it better. So we think that that's the way to go. So I'm really pushing for regionalization in our area to clean up the, to, to, uh, to enhance the cleaning up of the Budgets Bay. Um, I'm also doing something called Greasilla. And I will, let me see if I can get you a picture of this beautiful thing. Um, this is Greasilla. And, and what they are, there's some tanks. And, and in most communities, our biggest issue, one of our biggest issues is grease. Everywhere you go, there's food. So that becomes a burden when we try to treat uh, wastewater. So we're going to collect the grease, we're going to heat it, we're going to separate the oils, market the oil, lower our TSS, and we're going to have a product that comes into the treatment plant that has less, uh, less strength, if you will. It's going to be easier to treat. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, the podsies, uh, odors, gosh, if anybody lives near a treatment plant, you know the odors are, are real. Um, we don't do chocolate. Uh, we do some things that, uh, as, as she had said earlier, that can be odorous. So what we, we found, we had put an RFP out for covering. Uh, we have these open million gallon basins of, of raw sewer. So we, you know, we said, okay, what are we gonna do? And so we found these podsies and they're just little styrofoam, as you can see, eight-sided, and they stick together and they have a car activated carbon filters. And so what they do is they clean up the air, it doesn't smell, plus it reduces the carbon footprint. So it's two bangs for that one buck and we're pretty excited about that. So those are just some of the things that we're doing in Wareham. And this is an overhead view of the podsies. So you can see that this base now is completely covered um, and it really, really is effective in reducing odors and again, cleaning up the environment. So that leads us to this program and I wanna thank Joe Costa for this opportunity uh, to get, become part of this grant. And so at this time, I'm gonna have Russ talk specifically about the grant and we'll go from there. So thank you, thank you so much. Go ahead, Russ. You want here? I can yeah. get out of your way. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Guy. Uh, my name is Russ Kleekamp. I'm an engineer. I work uh, as a consultant for the town of Wareham. Um, and I worked a little bit on this project here for putting in uh, advanced monitors at the Wareham treatment plant to get a better understanding of the treatment process and what's happening there. But before I talk about that in detail, I just want to talk about nitrogen a little bit and also nitrogen pollution so everyone kind of understands where we're coming from. But, you know, the question is, what is nitrogen? Well, it's a naturally occurring element. You know, there's a symbol for it on the periodic table, and it's found quite abundantly all around us, in fact. 78, 79% of the air we breathe is made out of nitrogen. So when we're speaking of nitrogen pollution, it's really the abundance of nitrogen compounds that are entering into our water body. Um, if you think about it this way, for example, if you look at salt in the human diet, you know, salt is an essential nutrient that you need to 
balance electrolytes and perform other functions. But if you have too much of it, you really get some undesirable side effects. You get water retention, weight gain, high blood pressure, all these things that come along with it. So the nitrogen is really kind of the same thing. If you have too much nitrogen, um, one of the biggest uh, side effects or undesirable effects is you get these algae blooms and, and excessive plant life and nuisance vegetation. And not only does that present a, um, uh, a foul odor, uh, it's a nuisance for you know, people that enjoy the outdoors, that walk along the beaches, uh, but it also it takes the dissolved oxygen out of the water body. And on Cape Cod in the area, you have some very fragile resources. You have the shallow bays, uh, you have a lot of plant and animal life that really re relies on um, a set criteria that they've been used to for thousands of years. So when you change one of those parameters, such as oxygen levels, things like that, it really puts a big impact um, on, the, on, the, on the ecosystem that it's found in. And then where does it all come from? Because yes, it is eventually all a, a byproduct of human development. You know, we have um, excessive development, population leads to more septic tanks, uh, you have treatment facilities, you have agricultural resources, and for the longest time it was very loosely regulated. Unfortunately now we're dealing with some of the, um, uh, the problems from that. So this is just an image from around Cape Cod and the surrounding area. Some of, when, it, when I say the algae blooms, you can see the photographs from Buzzards Bay. I mean, you see thick, matted, I mean, it's not a, a colorful plant that you're gonna go out and have it in your fish tank. I mean, it's really a, a, a nuisance, uh, nuisance product. And then there's also things, for example, down in Crab Cove, you get what's called rusty tide, which is very uh, dangerous for the, for the, for the shellfish. If, if humans go and eat the shellfish during those conditions, um, it has a human health risk. Uh, so there's a number of uh, really undesirable side effects that you get from this nitrogen pollution. Uh, something that we hear quite a bit on is the eelgrass. Well, when these nitrogen mats form at the surface, it blocks out the sunlight. So this eelgrass that so many of uh, the ocean's uh, inhabitants use for, for raising their young or to take uh, shelter from, from, enemy or from, from the uh, other predators, um, this starts to get destroyed with the nitrogen pollution. So you're really doing a number on the bay. And this is one of those winter flounder that Guy was talking about that unfortunately this, this habitat's getting, uh, getting destroyed from the nitrogen pollution. And it's not just the saltwater bodies too. You have a lot of freshwater bodies that are seeing the impacts of nutrient loading. These are all ponds that are in southeastern Massachusetts and no, they're not photoshopped uh, by any, any event. Uh, Santuit Pond has been, uh, I'm a big bass fisherman, so every summer I'll go out and bass fish. And unfortunately, you see more and more of these algae blooms. Uh, the, the Westmont Ponset Pond holds a record for the most consecutive days being closed due to algae blooms. Um, they only stopped that, it was 176 days, and they only stopped counting because it was December 31st, and the Department of Public Health doesn't test after December 31st. So to get algae in that cold of water is really uh, not good. So the nitrogen cycle, uh, what happens with nitrogen when it comes into the wastewater treatment plant? I'm not gonna give you a lecture on each step of the process, but there's six major steps the nitrogen goes through. It starts at the headworks, which acts as kind of a large filter that, that basically takes out everything you're not supposed to flush, all the Q-tips, all the, the sanitary products, any rags or towels or anything that finds its way into the sewer system. Uh, then it goes through a cycle of the anoxic basins, the aeration basins, the clarifiers, where the bacteria that's within the plant actually eats the nitrogen uh, and it uses the oxygen to breathe that's bound to the nitrogen. So long story short, that's where you get the denitrification from in the plant. Then it goes through a step of sand filters, which acts as kind of a polishing measure, which uh, gives the water a final treatment before it's discharged. So this is an aerial of the treatment plant, and the nitrogen kind of follows this path. It comes in at the headworks, goes through the anoxic basins, the aeration basins, clarifiers, up to the sand filters, and then eventually out to the discharge on the Agawam River. So this is just a photograph. I mean, the, when we say treatment plant, it's really treating some, some funky stuff. I don't know how many of you had the pleasure of looking into a uh, sewer manhole, um, but it's not pretty what's lurking down there. So. This is an image here of a wastewater pump station, and uh, eventually we have to treat that to the point where it can be discharged into, uh, in a lot of times, very sensitive water bodies. On average, the nitrogen that you find in these, in raw wastewater, can be 20 to 85 uh, milligrams per liter, or 20 to 85 parts per million, and by the current standards, we have to get that down, uh, for example, Wareham, you have to get it down to four milligrams per liter, or, or four parts per million. So you're really doing about an 80 to 95% reduction in nitrogen. Um, which is great, but in some cases it's still not enough. You really want to try to find ways you can, you can lower that. The hard part is once you get into the single digits of nitrogen removal, it really starts getting difficult to, you know, to go from 10 to 5 milligrams is one thing, but to go from 5 down to 3, then down to underneath that, starts to become very difficult and very expensive to do that. 
So as a alternative to a very expensive plan upgrade, uh, we, we found out about this grant opportunity that the Buzzers Bay National uh, Estuary Program was offering. And for this project, it was a $75,000 grant where we supply a lot of very sensitive monitors or probes that can pick up all the different parameters of oxygen, nitrate, nitrite, ammonia, uh, pH, all these different uh, water quality characteristics. And those are installed at key points. I gave you those six areas of the wastewater treatment. Um, so if we put these probes at each one of these six areas, rather than testing the water at the outfall, and we can see, okay, we're high or we're low, we can really break down the treatment process at each step of the process. It's like a, a mechanic tuning a carburetor on an engine. You tune the carburetor to get the best performance out of the engine. Well, we're gonna tune the treatment plant to get the best performance out of it by using these monitors. So if we're looking at a, an anoxic basin and we know the dissolved oxygen has to be 0.5 milligrams per liter, if we're reading that it's too high or if it's too low, we can make that adjust, adjustment right there. We don't have to wait till we take that sample uh, at the end of the, the effluent pipe to see that we're doing something right or wrong. This is just a picture of some of the, the probes here. Um, they're pretty robust construction. They have to get submerged into the, the raw wastewater, uh, so they're introduced to a fairly hostile environment. Uh, like anything else, they do have to be cleaned and maintained. But again, it's what are these doing? I mean, they're, they're reading the physical characteristics of that water. Uh, depending on what the um, parameter is we're trying to look at, they, they measure quite a wide array of different, different parameters. So this is, you know, when it comes down to it, the schematic up here, this is a more detailed schematic of all the steps of the wastewater treatment plant. And I don't expect you to read all the monitors and everything that's going on, but all this information is relayed back to the computers at the wastewater treatment plant. So you can have an automated procedure where if you see a certain level of something isn't where it needs to be, you can control that right from a computer. And that's the first, first step of automation. The next step of automation is like a full step. It's like an automatic thermostat. When you come home at five o'clock, you want your house to be 69 degrees. Well, if we want our dissolved oxygen to be 0.5 milligrams per liter, as soon as that raises or lowers uh, beyond that threshold, the computer automatically controls that system to modify that. So it takes the human control out of the picture, which can reduce the, the aspect of human error. Now, you still need people watching this, but it really streamlines the whole process. So what are we trying to accomplish here? Obviously, the short-term goal is we want to reduce the amount of nitrogen going into Buzzards Bay. Even if we can reduce our discharge on average by a tenth of a milligram per liter, uh, at the amount of flow coming into the treatment plant, 800,000 gallons per day, that could work out to hundreds, if not thousands of, gallon, thousands of pounds per year of nitrogen that we're eliminating from Buzzards Bay. Um, when the plant's operating at its full capacity, it's significantly more than that. So an excellent midterm goal is after we kind of fine tune and perfect what we're doing here with these monitors, which in the grand scheme of things, a wastewater treatment is a very, very short, short money fix. Uh, we'd love to educate uh, the other uh, uh, plants that are, that are within the Buzzards Bay watershed and really anyone who's willing to listen. So maybe instead of spending millions on some treatment plant upgrade, they can invest 100,000 and really fine tune the process that they have. Uh, and then the long term goal is, is why we're all here tonight is really to improve or restore the water quality to Buzzards Bay. So with that, I will open it up to, I guess if you have questions, save it to the end, and that's when we're doing the, uh, the Q&A. So thank you very much. Well, good evening. Uh, my name's Eric Turkington, and I'm chairman of the Falmouth Water Quality Management Committee. And uh, almost all of you probably have no idea who, who the Water Quality Management Committee of Falmouth is and what they do. So I'm, I'm just gonna give you a brief sort of update on that. I also, by the way, brought with us the uh, consultant of the committee, Sia Karplus. If there are any questions afterwards, I will take the easy ones and she will take the hard ones. Because <laughs> the, uh, a few years ago, but the uh, town's sewer consultants came to the town and said, you have 15 estuaries in your town and to fix five of them will cost you $600 million. <laughs> Needless to say, the town of Falmouth uh, didn't think that was such a hot idea. And uh, the town looked around and said, this is not what we're gonna do here. We have 15 estuaries, we have more estuaries than anyone else in the Commonwealth, and uh, this is madness. So a group of us went to the selectmen and went to the town meeting and said, there are alternatives to this $600 million idea, and we would like to explore them because as we found, they had not been explored anywhere else before uh, in any real way. 
We went to the town meeting and said, we need money to do this and we need time to do this, and they gave us $2.7 million to do it. And so with, with that money and with that charge, we have spent the next several years pursuing alternatives to sewering. Uh, we're, we're, <clears throat> we're pursuing inlet opening, fertilizer reduction, uh, echo toilets, road runoff, permeable reactive barriers, innovative and alternative uh, treatment systems. And by pursuing them, I don't mean we're going to write some more papers and we're going to hire some more consultants to tell us what we already don't know. Our job was to identify the, the most likely nitrogen reduction methods, to implement them, to actually put them in the ground or into the water or into people's homes or into wherever they needed to be put, to monitor them vigorously before, during, and after to find out how well they worked, to cost them out, to see what they cost to do. So by the end of our process, which has only just begun, we're going to know more about alternatives to sewering, what's practical, what's real, what actually might be usable in the real world than anybody else, because no one else had done this before. So tonight I'm going to tell you about one of those alternatives that we've been exploring and, and, uh, and where it's going to be explored. Uh, we're talking about West Falmouth Harbor, And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's on the west coast of Cape Cod, facing Buzzards Bay. This is the watershed for West Falmouth Harbor and the zones of contribution that go into the harbor. Uh, as you can see, it starts all the way up at the military base, but it's pretty narrow and it gets you down to the harbor. A lot of open space here. There's, there's conservation land and, and protected land in through here. Um, the, the populated area is just on the west side of Route 28, pretty much. Uh, not densely populated, none of it's sewered. Uh, individual homes, a lot of seasonal homes. Um, so you would wonder, you know, why does West Falmouth Harbor have a big nitrogen problem? And it's an interesting question you would ask. This, along with the other 15 estuaries, and along with every other estuary on Cape Cod, has been studied by the Mass Estuaries Program and by uh, SMAST at the University of Massachusetts. And uh, like all the estuaries on Cape Cod, it is found to be overloaded with nitrogen. But this one is a little different. This pie chart, which is what the SMAS people put out for every estuary, all the studies they do, and it looks at first glance like every other estuary in every other pie chart, but this one is very different. If you look at this one, in most of them, the local control load, which is basically what you can do something about, <laughs> on most of them, this section would be devoted to home septic systems. In West Falmouth, this, uh, this section is the town's sewer treatment plant. The town's sewer treatment plant was built in a very disadvantageous location for West Falmouth Harbor. It was right upstream. So when they started putting sewerage into it and treating it and putting it into the ground, nitrogen in huge quantities started heading downhill into West Falmouth Harbor. And this, this began in the 80s, and by 1993, 4 and 5, they were seeing big gobs of nitrogen going in, out, into the harbor from the sewer treatment plant. You can see three quarters of it is coming from the tr treatment plant. Two percent is from uh, fertilizer, home fertilizer. Six percent is road runoff or something. Only 23 percent is, is, is the septic systems and the cesspools, which that's very different than, than most other places, because most places, fortunately, don't have a sewer treatment plant upstream. So the town of Falmouth's first job was to do something about the treatment plant. And they did. They've spent millions of dollars. They now have a treatment plant which is producing nit nitrogen at levels less than three. Our, our friend from Wareham was talking about four. We're talking about three, less than three milligrams per liter. That is as 
lower, as low or lower than any other treatment plant in Massachusetts. It, it's doing its job very well. Um, we've also spent a lot of money very recently to, to, to make that even better. We're getting it below three uh, with, with an additional set of uh, uh, treatments. And we just have uh, installed uh, flow meters to, to more accurately figure exactly how much is going out of that plant into that harbor. Um, so that, that is what the town has done about the treatment plant. And, and there's more to be done, but, but as I say, right now it's state of the art as far as the nitrogen reduction. Uh, another thing we've done is a, a bylaw saying f no fertilizer will be applied anywhere in town within 100 feet of a, of a water body. It's the toughest fertilizer control bylaw in the state of Massachusetts. Um, it's got a story of its own, which is that the fertilizer industry fought us like demons when we sent this up to the legislature, because it it's a home rule bill. It had to be passed by the legislature as well as by the town. They fought us tooth and nail. Uh, they did not want anybody telling anybody not to use fertilizer anywhere. <laughs> and uh, we beat them. We got our bylaw through. It's the only one in the state that says you will do nothing within 100 feet of a, of a water body. And every year we send out a letter to everybody in town who owns a piece of land within 100 feet of the water body saying, here's the law, follow it. So we're doing what we can with the nitrogen. Shellfish cultivation is, is another one of our alternatives that has turned out to be impressively successful. We now grow little oysters, little oysters by the millions, two million a year. We grow them from little oysters to, to good-sized oysters then we transplant them into the harbors and the bays, and they gobble up nitrogen, like you wouldn't believe. And every year they gobble up the nitrogen, and when they get big enough, we tell everyone in town, come on in and harvest them. Take them home, feed them to your family. A million or two of those a year make a big, big difference. In, in West Falmouth, we've done it for the last two years. It reduces, uh, oops, it reduces nitrogen uh, 160 kilograms a year. So that's gonna be a big part of our future plan for West Falmouth Harbor. But what we're coming here to tell you about tonight <clears throat> is something that's even more exotic because it hasn't been, once again, hasn't been tried in a, in a very successful way anywhere else. This is what we call, give the harbor a hand. Uh, the original name for it was gonna be the Filthy 40, but <laughs> But we thought the funding agencies wouldn't think that was such a hot idea. So uh, we didn't, e when we got to them, we didn't even call it Give the Harbor a Hand. We ended up calling it the West Falmouth Harbor Shoreline Septic Remediation Demonstration. <laughs> uh, so that, that is its official name. But basically the principle is this. If you're within 300 feet of the harbor, what you put into your toilet and your cesspool and your septic system is probably ending up in the harbor. In fact, it's certainly ending up in the harbor. So that's our target audience. We're looking at those people and we're saying, what have you got in the ground here? And what can we do to reduce the nitrogen that comes out of your house into that harbor? Well, in West Falmouth, some of these people have owned their houses on the waterfront for 100 years, They're the family. So needless to say, a lot of them do not have state-of-the-art Title V septic systems. Some of them have cesspools. Some of them have very old cesspools. Um, and of course, if you never sell it, you never have to upgrade it because Title V only kicks in when you have to upgrade. So this, the very strong suspicion is that these waterfront houses and the ones close to the water are contributing a good bit of nitrogen uh, we're going to find out. And here's, and here's what this, what this pro program is going to do. We have, and of course, if I could turn my head around better, I'd, I'd, I'd see my own stuff here. Um, we have $250,000. This is a federal grant uh, through the state. Uh, $10,000 per house is going to be the incentive plan. We're gonna to say to these people, if you will install an innovative alternative system, and we're gonna make you some proposals as to which ones they can be, if you will install them and let us monitor them uh, through SMAS, we'll give you 10,000 bucks. Might work. Uh, 
That's the premise here, that we can find at least 20 residences that are willing to do this. Um, we're going to offer them as a 10 or 15 alternatives, 15 actually, alternatives. The criterion is going to be it has to produce effluent of 12 milligrams of nitrogen per liter or better. Now, now remember, the treatment plant gets it down to three or four. We're talking 12, so it isn't going to be treatment plant quality, but it's going to be about a third of what they're putting into the ground now. Um, at the end of it, we will know what works in the ground in West Falma. We'll know how much it costs to put in the ground, how much it costs to maintain it, how much it costs to operate it. We'll have answers for all this. Because for all these years that all the experts have been spending your money and my money on, and, on studies and, and proposals, none of them have ever actually done this to see what works in the ground in Falmouth or anywhere else. So we, we've got a good community together, which includes Jerry Potamus from Falmouth and uh, Sia and Rachel and Curran from, from the coalition. George Hoyfelder, who uh, has, runs the uh, treatment test center in, uh, in Barnstable County, which is recognized nationally as, as a validation entity for, for this sort of thing. They've put together a program that, first of all, takes a look at the sites. We're going to rank these, the people who are within 300 feet of the harbor. How close are they to the shore? The closer, the better. How old is their septic system? This is interesting. Poor, uh, poor Corrin has been down at the Falmouth Board of Health going through ancient records trying to figure out how old people's septic systems are. Um, how much water you use? Obviously, the, the more the better. And, uh, and where are you in the, in, in the watershed? So, so we're, we're, they're going to prioritize the people in terms of who we would like to have in the program, and then they're going to approach them one by one and say, do you want this? Not only, uh, the suspicion is that a lot of them will do it, not for the $10,000. If you own waterfront property in West Falmouth Harbor, you don't need $10,000. But for the bay and for the harbor, these people, by definition, love the place. That's why they're there. And they want to do the right thing by it. And I think we're going to have no trouble at all finding 20 people willing to do this. So there's going to be 15 alternatives for these people to choose from. Uh, the eligible vendors have been vetted in terms of who can get it down to 12 per, and, and, who, you know, and a number of other criteria. But the premise here is these are options that are available now on the market, available to be installed in your backyard or in your house, uh, depending on uh, uh, the program. They'll be monitored a great deal. Uh, and at the end, uh, we're going to know a lot. They're going to start installing these things this year. This is not something that's coming in the hazy future. It's coming now. Here's the 15 options. <laughs> As you can see, there are a lot of options. Uh, they, they all have pros and cons. Uh, you know, it, the beauty of a Title V system right now is it's a box and it's underground and you never have to see it. And, and once every few years you pump it if you're doing the right thing. Uh, these systems, none of them are that easy, you know. They, they're all going to have more complication. They're going to have more uh, demands on the owners. They're going to have costs that you don't have now. Uh, and that's what the $10,000 is really for, to give people an incentive to at least cover the cost. But at the end of this program, we're going to find out which one of these actually work in real life. I mean, they all, they all will send you a brochure telling you how terrific they are. We need to know how they work in the ground in our town. And uh, that is what we're trying to do here. At the end of the day, Falmouth is not going to sewer $600 million worth of sewering. We're going to do something different. And we're going to do it differently because we, know, we will know what works. Um, all, one thing we've, we've all learned in this process is that the DEP and the consultant industry and the sewer construction industry all have similar goals, which is fine, to clean up the nitrogen. But they only have one way to do it. 
they are a hammer and everything to them looks like a nail. Everything to them looks like something that ought to be sewered. We can't afford that and we don't want to do that. But the only way you can beat that industry is with facts and with science. So at the, by the end of the day, Falmouth is going to have the facts and the science to say what works, what doesn't work, what alternatives are practical, and then we'll do them, because we're going to clean this harbor up. Any questions at the end, I guess, and see we'll be here to answer them. <laughs> Um, my name is Joe Coster. I'm uh, director of the Buzz Bay National Estuary Program. Uh, Anne asked me to give a presentation talking about stormwater, and she framed it as uh, what does the average resident need to know about stormwater, and specifically what can they do about it, what, what can they do to help solve the problem. The, the previous uh, couple of presentations have talked about uh, nutrient pollution, nitrogen pollution if you're discharging to salt water or phosphorus pollution if you're worried about algal blooms in a lake. And there's, there's other kinds of pollution that we have to deal with. Um, and I want to draw a contrast between nitrogen pollution and uh, bacteria pollution. Um, nutrient pollution is, as people have mentioned, it's like fertilizing the water. You add fertilizer to your yard, to your garden, it makes the plants grow more robust, the same thing happens in the ocean. You get more algae, and there's a lot of bad things that can happen to, uh, because uh, of too much algal growth. You can smother shellfish beds with large accumulations of algae, you've seen that. It can reduce the oxygen concentrations in the water column. Uh, you can lose habitat, uh, Russia showed a nice picture of uh, eelgrass beds. You lose those valuable resources. Um, when we talk about bacteria, problems, and it's, it's an equally serious problem in many respects, um, you're talking about a human health hazard. There's bacteria in the water that make it unsafe to swim in or unsafe to eat the shellfish. So um, most of my talk uh, is going to be about bacteria pollution and specifically um, how stormwater contributes to that and what you can do about it. Uh, so again, nutrient pollution, you're killing off the shellfish. You're killing off the eelgrass. That's actually a, a much worse problem. Uh, with bacteria pollution, the shellfish is uh, there, but you can't uh, eat them. Uh, so in some respects, it's a, it's a little bit uh, of an easier problem to solve because you just need to reduce the bacteria to low enough concentrations that it's no longer a risk to swim in the water, no longer a risk to eat the shellfish. Uh, when we talk about stormwater, pollution, stormwater runoff, rainfall running off the land. Uh, water goes downhill and eventually goes into a river, a pond. It may soak into the ground, uh, but a lot of it gets directly discharged to our surface waters, including the bay. Um, it conveys lots of different kinds of pollution, but uh, again, I'm going to be talking about uh, bacteria pollution because uh, it's the primary cause of a lot of shellfish bed closures in Buzzards Bay. Um, generally, the, the theme is, uh, what are you laughing at? Oh, sorry. Um, more development means more impervious surface, more stormwater volume, faster flow rates, you're washing off more material off the land, and it means more pollution. And again, um, stormwater, uh, lots of different uh, pollutants in there. Certainly uh, things like fertilizer, people fertilizing their lawn, it goes on the driveway, it goes on the sidewalk, it gets washed into the stormwater system. Uh, but I'm going to be talking mostly about bacteria uh, because there's a lot of regulations and concerns that drive that. Um, I did want to point out, and I'm sorry, uh, oops. Um, in, in an earlier slide, I forgot to point out that um, there are systems to collect our stormwater. That's a grate, and that's called a, um, a curb inlet, um, where you just have a big slot uh, going into the bay. And I'm sorry, I should have pointed that out. When you have those kinds of systems that have the big slot going into the bay, they don't collect debris. They don't, 
plastic bottles thrown into the street, plastic cups thrown in the street, go right into the storm system. This is a photograph of um, a Cushionet River, um, upper New Bedford Harbor, and you see all the debris that gets flushed out of the stormwater system. This is not unique to New Bedford. It's any town that has uh, an urban center in those kind of stormwater systems where there's no grading and a tremendous amount of um, debris gets washed into the street. Uh, I was at a project in town uh, where they were putting in new curb cuts, and I'm saying, why aren't you putting uh, grates uh, instead of these uh, curb inlets? And uh, well, the merchants along the street didn't want to have uh, debris collecting on the street in front of their shops. Uh, they didn't want to have um, flooding because debris clogs those grates. So it's easier to allow it to all flush into the bay, to flush into the rivers. Um, there's a lot of education campaigns out there. This is a, a nice one that uh, uh, the state of Washington Department of Ecology put out uh, to communicate uh, to residents, um, uh, the sources of pollution. And, you know, in, in areas we, we talk about field septic systems, I'll, I'll, I'll get into things like uh, uh, cross connections with sewer lines, but a lot of times we're dealing with just animal waste in the street. It gets washed into the storm system, and that's one of the contributors to, 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 to bacteria. Uh, a lot of you don't realize that most car washes nowadays have recycling, recirculating systems to reuse the water. Uh, wastewater treatment plants don't like to have w what's now labeled industrial wastewater going into their system, and there are fairly strict regulations that talk about what can go into septic systems. So um, a lot of agencies now discourage people from washing their car in there on the street, uh, bring it to a car wash because that water is treated and recirculated. Um, and again, I talked about the litter and of course, Leaking oil from cars um, causes that nice sheen that you see in, in roads. Again, I, 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 our focus, a lot of our focus when my program is dealing with stormwater is to treat bacteria, and it's because we want to open up shellfish beds. Uh, the red areas are the areas close to shellfishing in Buzzards Bay, typically on a July 1st. Um, there's a few, like an area outside of the... Um, New Bedford outfall, that's a mandatory closure. You can't have an open shellfish bed if you have an ocean outfall uh, in the vicinity of the outfall. Uh, but most of the embayments, um, you're dealing with local sources of pollution. Uh, when I first started my job, uh, people um, in Falmouth and other towns used to think, oh, our shellfish beds are closed because of the New Bedford outfall. Uh, nonsense. It's all local sources. No, I'm serious. And, and it's, it's still uh, perpetuated out there that uh, that is the cause. Um, no, it, it is local sources of, um, of uh, pollution. Uh, we have uh, had an effort with the municipalities and a group called the Buzzards Bay Action Committee to map uh, stormwater discharges and catch basins in Buzzards Bay. And, and here's the, the the areas around uh, Buzzards Bay, I have the towns labeled. The green dots are catch basins on the street. Uh, the red dots are stormwater outfalls. And it's kind of hard to see with the shading here. These are urbanized areas, uh, basically uh, more than 500 people per square mile. Uh, so you can see where the development is along the bay, and sorry about that. Um, and you can see um, where the outfalls are. Now let's superimpose that on my shellfish bed closure map. Oh, uh, this is an excellent point. Um, to, to emphasize why stormwater, or, or to, to recognize why stormwater is, is important, um, you'll, you'll sometimes see this in the newspaper. This was from um, uh, an article, uh, I think it was a, uh, either Cape Cod Times or New Bedford Stand Times, uh, last year, all of Buzzards Bay closed to shellfishing due to heavy rains. Uh, and I forget, it, it was something like a seven inch rainfall. And basically all the uh, bay was close to shellfishing. And again, it's sometimes you have sewer overflows like in New Bedford, but in most towns it's just because you have storm drains everywhere uh, discharging um, into the bay. These are more urban settings. You have them in rural areas too. All right, you've heard a lot of talk about requirements to meet nitrogen, pollution standards. The agencies have set a lot of 
new requirements limiting how much nitrogen can go into an estuary. And you've also, as Eric pointed out, uh, there's a cost if you do that um, through traditional sewering uh, of meeting those standards. Uh, and it will cost billions uh, if you go the conventional route. Uh, there's a similar set of standards that have been adopted for stormwater. And it just hasn't hit the papers as much. It hasn't, you know, got as much press time. But in all these little um, pink and orange areas, these are the areas around the bay that are impaired because of bacteria pollution. And the agencies are now saying that towns have to start treating stormwater discharges, just like we treat our wastewater discharges in, in, in treatment plants and, and um, uh, septic system. We have to treat our stormwater so that we can start opening up these shellfish beds. Um, Whenever you're trying to solve a problem, you have to appreciate and understand the scale. Um, we talk about watersheds and drainage basins. Uh, a watershed, and, and again, a lot of the general public, they have an inkling of this, but basically a drop of rain anywhere within this blue line eventually makes it to Buzzards Bay, either through the ground or through rivers. So if we're looking at problems in Buzzards Bay, and Buzzards Bay, by the way, is mostly a very clean area. The problems are all in the estuaries uh, here. Uh, I have some sewage outfalls. There's New Bedford's. The town of Fairhaven's outfall is inside the hurricane barrier. Uh, Marion's is a creek that goes to the ocean here. Uh, same thing with um, uh, Wareham's and as Eric mentioned uh, in West Falmouth there's a groundwater discharge over here. So we have these big nitrogen sources. Oh and there's Dartmouth's. We have these big pollution sources for nitrogen but again, these are not so much the problems of our bacteria pollution, although in New Bedford we do have all those little green dots. It's an old system. Our stormwater and our sewer lines are connected so that when it rains, there is so much water, because New Bedford is so much impervious, so much pavement, uh, that the system overflows, and it overflows out through all those little dots, and... Um, um, they, that causes closures in, in that area. But for most of the time, when I'm talking about a closure, it, this is a Ponagansett Bay, uh, Peyton Aaron Village is right there. If I have a shellfish bed closure in a Ponagansett Bay, I'm looking at the sources in this watershed, and there's all our stormwater discharge pipes. Uh, I might be interested also in the Buttonwood Park Zoo because it turns out there's tremendous amounts of bacteria and nitrogen that's coming out of this stream as documented in the coalition's water quality monitoring program. But in practical terms, when we start getting down to the pipe level, and you have to fix it pipe by pipe, there you're talking about doing an evaluation of, okay, how are the catch basins, what catch basins are connected to that pipe? Here it is discharging to a wetland near a river. Uh, what is being collected, and you can see in these more suburban settings, there's a, there's a lot of pavement on a road, but there's a lot of impervious on the roof. That's contributing often to the stormwater system that the town is responsible for, and they will have to spend money to fix. So here's an example of a project, uh, and actually Russ worked on this one, um, with Mass Maritime Academy in the town of Bourne. This is a discharge not far from the Cape Cod Canal. Um, you had all these little homes um, in a parking lot hooked up to a pipe. And basically, to, and, and you had a shell, closed shellfish bed over here. To treat the stormwater, we basically had to soak um, as much of the stormwater as possible into the ground. And this shows actually one of the galleys near the street, but I want to show you the, oh, I, I'm missing a slide. Um, there's a, a slide of a, a, a torn up parking lot they actually dug up a strip in the middle of this parking lot, and it looks like a garden if you were just to, 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 to drive by or park in that parking lot, but it's called a rain garden. All the rainwater is directed into that, and it's underlaid with some pipes, and the water is treated. This particular uh, stormwater treatment system was so effective that uh, I have a picture of the pipe before the system was constructed, and there's a great big gully. Every time there's a heavy rain, there's a gully in front of the pipe on this little beach. 
It's so effective that no more stormwater comes out of this pipe, even with that really heavy rain that we had last year. It was so effective, and there's no more stormwater coming out of the pipe, that DMF, a division, the state's division of fisheries, opened up the shellfish bed for the first time in, a, in about a decade. It cost $225,000 to fix that one pipe. This has been going on for a long time. Um, Mark Gifford, who used to be with the um, uh, Wareham Department of Public Works, he was reminding me that you know, one of our first projects was in Wareham. Again, we get grants, technical assistance, we work with towns to treat stormwater. And there's been so many projects that have been going on over the years. The pink is the permanently closed shellfish beds in Buzzards Bay, basically those red shaded areas I showed you on the map. They've been steadily going down, most, most impressively during the 90s, really leveling off, we, we, we've picked the low-hanging fruit, but towns in the state have been working really hard to treat the stormwater. You know, some of these, maybe about to this level here, are those permanent closures around outfalls and other areas like that that we probably won't open up, but there's still a long ways to go uh, in terms of opening up shellfish beds, at least a portion of the year. The green are areas that are closed um, seasonally. Uh, uh, many uh, harbors are closed just during the summer. So um, our, our motivation for managing stormwater has changed over the year. Uh, primarily, originally, it was just get the water off the road. We don't like flooding. Uh, people complain. And, and now we have a whole suite of reasons, some regulatory, some because the towns want to have open up shellfish beds. Um, they're, they're doing more to control stormwater. Um, Stormwater management is not scary, but it will cost a lot of money. Uh, again, we talked about billions to solve the septic system problem. It's probably close to a billion dollars over 20 years to open up the shellfish beds around Buzzards Bay that I showed you. Um, a lot of things that we do is working with towns to control development and redevelopment. And this is something from a slide, we call it low impact development, where you try to reduce impervious surfaces, uh, you try to have narrow roads, you try to direct stormwater, not through curbs and stormwater systems, but wherever possible. You can't do this in New Bedford, obviously, there's other things you can do. The one thing that I'd like everyone in this audience to do when, when, when they go home is look to see where your downspouts go off your house. If you have a downspout that goes to a driveway that runs into the street, which may go into a river or a pond, if you're in a situation like that, I'd like you to get the downspout redirected. You can get cheap corrugated tubing. Um, you can redirect the downspout into different areas, um, direct it to a garden. But one of the biggest challenges that we face and I showed you that little residential street, is so much of the stormwater coming onto the roads is coming off private property, off of their roofs, and a lot of the roof runoff, it's fairly clean. I just want people to take care of the water on their own property. Um, you see a lot of discussion about rain barrels. I actually hate rain barrels. Uh, a roof, a one-inch rain, is generating about 400 to 500 gallons of rain. You're putting a 55-gallon drum at the end of the pipe. If you're using it, that's great. If it's just sitting there full all the time, it does nothing. If you have it attached, bleeding into a, a drip infiltration in a little garden, that's great. But I'd rather have you just direct the stormwater so it doesn't go into um, the road. Some towns, it's a bigger problem than others. If you're in Falmouth, Bourne, Wareham, you have nice sandy soils, the water soaks into the ground, it's less of an issue. If you're in Marion, Fairhaven, uh, New Bedford, uh, it's a lot tougher for the soils. Um, rain gardens, they're, they're an engineered solution. We try to get towns to work within the road layout. Uh, a lot of you don't realize that. You know, there's a, a strip on either side that the town actually owns to try to direct stormwater into that area. You can build your own rain garden. Um, in terms of summarizing the things that you can do to help, and, and by the way, this is from another campaign. This is Los Angeles Stormwater Campaign. Wishful thinking, until this is a reality, please pick up after your pet. And of course, it shows a men's room, a ladies' room, and a little doggy door, and the doggy is dragging out toilet paper. 
So pick up, you know, pick up uh, uh, pet waste is a big one. Um, this is the coalition. They had a, a don't, don't drunk stenciling campaign in New Bedford. Um, but again, you, you've seen most of these, uh, you know, uh, fertilize it, don't dump anything in the storm drain. Um, sweep up sand, litter, and debris in front of your, your property if it's one of those drains that go to the, to, to the bay. Uh, and in situations like uh, New Bedford, I, I'm amazed, I, I, I grew up in this town, and when I come back, I see so much more impervious surface. It seemed like there was so many more little green patches in trees and, 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 and lawns, and so much of it is get paved over. But if you have the opportunity to create more impervious surface, more green and less pavement, um, uh, do it. So I'll just stop right there. Thanks. All right, well, I don't know if anybody ran track or, or swam. Um, I used to swim, and uh, the anchor is the one who comes in at the end and tries to make up time. <laughs> and I have been charged with being the anchor tonight and was nervous that we might be running short on time and asked me to do my best to, uh, to keep, keep, keep things short and sweet and to the point. And so I promised her that I would be done in under 10 minutes. So you can, you can test me and hopefully we will have plenty of time for questions. Um, so again, my, I'm Rachel Jacuba. I'm the Science Director at the Buzzards Bay Coalition, and I'm going to be talking to you today about some of the research we're doing on cranberry bogs. So this is a map of the Buzzards Bay watershed, which is outlined in the, um, in the hash line here. And what I want you to notice is that we have the, the areas, surface areas in red are cranberry bogs. And what you can see is that cranberry bogs are a dominant form or are the dominant form of, of agriculture in the Buzzards Bay watershed. And they're really concentrated in areas along water bodies. So the, the blue here are streams and rivers. And so you can see in the Wee Wee Antic um, watershed in particular, we have a lot of cranberry bogs associated near to the water body. And as agriculture goes, Cranberry bogs are actually a relatively low form of neutral, there's a relatively low amount of fertilizer put on cranberry bogs. But unlike most agriculture, the cranberry bogs are, you know, they're wetland plants. They're associated with waterways. And so fertilizer that goes on cranberry bogs has a, usually a very short amount of time to make it to water bodies, and that can make it particularly problematic. And in some portions of the Buzzards Bay watershed, you can see we have a really dense concentration of cranberry bogs. And in fact, um, the Wee Wee Antic River watershed is the mo has more cranberry bogs than any other coastal watershed in Massachusetts. Okay, so you've already seen one of these pie, pie charts tonight, so you're prepped. Uh, this is data from the, the Massachusetts Estuaries oops, Project. Let me get rid of that if I can. Um, and what you can see on the left is a plot that's pretty similar to the ones that Eric showed, where we have the dominant form. So these pie charts show you where different sources, where of the overall nitrogen load that's coming into a water body, what are the different fractions, where is that nitrogen load coming from? And so on the left, we have the Agawam River subwatershed, and you can see wastewater is the dominant form of nitrogen coming into that watershed. Um, cranberry is a factor there too, but it's, it's much less significant than wastewater. And this is more typical. This is actually, this much cranberry is unusual. Well, for the overall Buzzards Bay watershed, this is still a lot of cranberry nitrogen. But in general, um, wastewater is very much the dominant type of nitrogen getting into the watershed. However, you saw from the map previously that we have areas in the, in the Buzzards Bay watershed where we actually have enough cranberry bogs to get a cranberry nitrogen as the dominant form of nitrogen in a water body. So this is an important problem that we need to figure out how we can reduce nitrogen coming off cranberry bogs, because we have to reduce nitrogen coming off of everywhere, including cranberry bogs. Okay. So what do we know about 
cranberry nitrogen? The answer is, is not a great deal. So there's been a lot of studies all around the country and, and, and the world of how much nitrogen comes from septic tanks and wastewater treatment plants. They're pretty well studied um, sources of nitrogen. However, cranberries are, you know, they're grown in Massachusetts, they're grown in Wisconsin, now in Canada, but not very many places. Cranberry agriculture is not, you know, not something that too many people worry about. Um, and so there's not very much quantitative information on, the, on nitrogen coming from cranberry bogs. There's only two scientific studies in southeastern Massachusetts. And the values from those studies range by over threefold, so three times. And so that makes it, when you're trying to make decisions, management decisions about how we reduce nitrogen, how we do it from cranberry bogs is a real, it's a real stickler because depending on which number you use, you need to reduce more, you know, significantly more or significantly less. And this uncertainty is, is a big problem in terms of deciding, again, how much nitrogen we reduce from cranberry bogs. And if it's not coming from cranberry bogs, it's coming from somewhere else, most likely wastewater. So it affects not only how, what the cranberry bog owners have to do, but it affects what towns have to do in terms of how much nitrogen they would have to remove from municipal um, systems. So what the coalition has been doing is we've been working in partnership with uh, the UMass Cranberry Experiment Station, the Marine Biological Lab, the Town of Carver, the Cape Cod Cranberry Growers Association to do a, a study of two common bog configurations. So on the top is a picture of a what we're calling a long tail pathway bog. And so we have here um, a cranberry bog and the water comes in from Rocky Pond into this bog and then it goes down this sort of vegetated channel along here and eventually out to the Wee Antic River. Um, so that's bogs like that configuration we are calling long tail pathway. The second um, bog configuration that we're looking at is called a closed loop and that is where you have water coming into the bog from a, a source, in this case a pond, and going right back out to the same, to the same place. Um, and so these are two common bog configurations and part of what we've hypothesized is that the type of bog configuration makes a difference in terms of how much nitrogen is coming off that bog. And I told you there were two studies that have been done in the past. One of the studies was sort of what we think of as the worst case um, bog configuration where the river is the middle of, the, you know, the bog is directly adjacent to the river. The river flows through the bog. It's called a, um, a pass-through through bog. And so these are more typical bogs um, that represent a greater percentage of the bogs out there and are, are certainly where bog owners are, are transitioning to. So we looked at six bogs, three of each type, over um, two harvests and two harvests and two winter floods, and our project was funded by um, DEP and the Buzzards Bay National Estuary uh, Program. And a, qu a quick Cliff Notes version of the results. Um, so the six, six study bogs had nitrogen exports during floods on the low end of existing values. So I told you there was a range, you know, a threefold range, and our our study sites came in on the low end of that range. Um, the long tail bogs did provide an opportunity for attenuation under some conditions. So one of our hypotheses was that you have this vegetated channel, it's an opportunity for water flowing through that vegetated channel for the um, plants to take up some of the nitrogen and remove it before it gets out to the waterway. And that does seem to bear out in some, um, under some conditions. Um, while we were doing this research, we were working also, um, which actually this is a picture of Casey Kennedy who works um, for the uh, agricultural, agricultural Research Service. He's stationed at the Cranberry Station and he was doing research at the same time that we were and um, some of his research has showed some, some interesting results that we are learning from and two points that, we're learning, that we've learned from what Casey's done is that grab sampling, which is so collecting water samples by, you know, literally taking a grab sample in a water bottle, which is, is how our study was designed, can miss some crucial times of nutrient export. Um, most, most importantly, summer rains. So it's hard to be there right when the rain is falling, falling and, and grab a sample. Um, and also that when you're releasing a flood, so you know these are um, millions of gallons of water being released from, from a bog, and it turns out that we, the sort of conceptually, we had been thinking that you have a volume of water, it has a concentration of nitrogen, you let it go, and then the nitrogen concentration is consistent through the whole process. But what Casey showed by doing very fine scale, sort of every five to 10 minute sampling, was that there are different 
as the water is released, the nitrogen concentration changes. Um, and this is actually potentially some, some good news in terms of trying to actually manage that nitrogen because trying to manage the release of um, you know, 10 million gallons of water is much more difficult than if we can release the first eight of that and let it go and only manage the last two, then we have a, it's an easier logistical problem and therefore something that growers are more likely to take on. Um, and so what we've learned from this study um, is, is both some interesting results, but also what we, what we don't know. And so what we're gonna be doing next is um, working on, on, our, on our study bugs, study bogs, installing automated water samplers that can be used, that can trigger collection of water samples with changes in water level. So when a summer storm happens, a sample can be automatically collected, or when a flood is released, a sample can be automatically collected. So we can get some of this finer scale resolution information. And uh, one of the things that we also learned was that understanding the volume of water um, is a little bit more uh, complicated than we appreciated, and so installing flow meters that measure flow uh, continuously will allow us to get a better handle on that and, again, refine our estimates. And this um, new project that we're working on is funded by EPA through the Buzzards Bay National Estuary Project. And I'll end it there. My question is, what, is uh, what was the cost or what is the average cost of the innovative and alternative systems to Eric? You were offering $10,000 to the homeowner, but what does that mean? Uh, range of costs, honestly, um, twenty-five thousand dollars may be average, but some are in the ten and some are higher, and it depends on if you're talking about the capital cost or the twenty-year present worth cost. <clears throat> so that's part of really what we're doing with the study is we're looking at what does it cost to install them, what does it really cost to operate, maintain, and monitor them. But what we're looking at from vendor information, just the preliminary, is that an average installed cost is twenty-five thousand dollars. Uh, Eric, you said that the uh, installations will provide data for the efficacy of the systems. Aren't you getting answers from the county, uh, the, the county uh, septic system test, testing field as it is now? Well, there's a couple of differences. They aren't necessarily testing all these 15, um, and they're testing them in one location for a short period. It, 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 frankly, it's a location that may have different soils and different a lot of things than, than what's around West Falmouth Harbor. Um, so we, we have, their data has been useful in, in deciding which of, of, how to get to the 15. Uh, but beyond that, I, I think we need to know more about each of the 15 on location that, than we do. Um, I just wanted to thank you, Anne, for putting this together. Um, I just think it's a remarkable evening to get all these different opinions and ideas. Thank you for doing that. Um, I have a question. Um, I heard the other day, uh, I think it was NPR, a story from England about baby wipes, and that baby wipes have been um, overused and flushed and flushed and flushed in many places, and more and more popular, and they're not really flushable, and, and they apparently create an enormous wad in the pipes. Or a, I just wondered if any of you had any comments on that. Baby wipes are a major problem, and there's a lot of research done. Trying to get the manufacturer to address it. Um, we have 45 pump stations, and I can tell you daily we're in the pump stations deragging, if you will, taking out the baby wipes. So they are flushable. They're not lying to you. They're flushable, but they're not degradable. Um, bluntly, the only thing you flush, white toilet paper. That's it. And, and it's not just baby wipes. We've got chlorine wipes. We've got all kinds of wipes that fall into that category. And also, keep in mind, toilet paper is crazy, too, because now you're going to start seeing bamboo toilet paper. So pay attention to what you're buying, because it does cost a tremendous amount of money to, to get them out of the system. It is a problem. You're absolutely right. It's crazy. 
<clears throat> there's some education going on now. Uh, matter of fact, there's a video I'm, I'm, I already produced, and we're getting out to one of our engineers, and they're going to uh, they're going to publicize it. You'll see more. Uh, we do a public program called One Where the Yellow Went. And in that program, we educate folks, and we do that on a weekly program. But there's other things. Um, again, it's through the manufacturers. There's also um, different, uh, you know, like WEF, uh, NUIR. Uh, they're doing a lot of educational programs also. So it's getting out there. Um, but it's our responsibility. It's our responsibility to get the, me the message to you. And so through the school systems, we're trying to educate the, the children because they, return, they retain and they don't have any hang-ups, but yes, through the kids, kids bring it to you, and so that's what we're trying to do to get the message out there. Yes, absolutely, it is a problem. Thanks for the question. Good question. Uh, this is for one, of, one or all of you. Um, so I was at a restaurant recently, and uh, only sea scallops were available, um, and I understand the bay scallops, the small ones, used to grow in Buzzards Bay quite profusely, but just, uh, that's a fisheries that has just died out. Um, how many fisheries, because of the nitrogen problem, correct? Um, how many fisheries like that used to be here? Um, and uh, how, how many really have sort of failed recently? And do you see anything coming back? Well, I, I remember the oysters in West Falmouth Harbor. I, in 1980, you could go out there and pick them up a bushel in half an hour, and shortly after that, they dwindled down to nothing and uh, pretty much stayed that way. But, uh, I can't speak for any other water bodies, but uh, that's what happened in West Falmouth and Waukoit Bay soon after. So something happened in the early 80s in, in most of Falmouth's water bodies that killed off the uh, scallops. Yeah, I, I would echo that in terms of uh, nutrients. Uh, bay scallops, if you've ever seen a little baby scallop, it has little threads at the base of it, kind of like a muscle, and it attaches itself to surfaces. And bay scallop attaches to eelgrass beds, it attaches to other surfaces. And when you get a really, what we call eutrophic, too much nitrogen in the water, and the eelgrass disappears, the bay scallop doesn't have a, a substrate to settle on. If it gets on the bottom, it gets smothered with uh, algae. So, uh, more than most shellfish, it was very sensitive to habitat loss because of nitrogen pollution. Other species have disappeared, like uh, softshell clams. That may be a little more complicated. Uh, it may be related to um, green crabs. It's an introduced species uh, that really do a lot of devastation to plants, salt marsh, uh, and, 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 and clams. So there's a lot of different stories out there, but if you're looking for uh, a nutrient pollution story, probably one of the best is the base gallop. Um, Joe, you mentioned that the outfall from the Fairhaven sewage treatment plant is inside the hurricane dike. How big a problem is that, and is there any chance that it will ever get moved outside? In the MEP report, uh, the same reports that have been done on the Cape, um, I think the sewer treatment plant was something like 40% or 50% of the nitrogen load to the harbor, so it's the big chunk. They were recommending that Fairhaven's plant go to very, very low levels of nitrogen, and there was also a proposal, and this was advocated by, I think, the coalition of trying to tie into the New Bedford wastewater plant to eliminate the outfall from the harbor. And, you know, that was a, a, an idea that was floated. I, I don't know how far it'll go. But it's a big part of the problem. You do have septic systems in New Bedford Harbor. You have a lot of impervious. So if you look at stormwater, in, in, little, in a lot of little embayments, stormwater might be 5% of the problem. In an urban center like New Bedford uh, Harbor, it's probably like 20 or 25%. So uh, it's a different set of problems, but the Fairhaven plant is a big part of it. Uh, you were talking about some in situ con continually monitoring uh, the, at the cranberry bogs, and you were and Russ was talking about sensors for continual monitoring of nitrogen and ammonia or nitrate and ammonia at a treatment facility. Can we talk a little bit about more about what those sensors are? How deployable are they in estuaries? How much they cost? There's some information about those. 
Uh, just as a, uh, a ballpark cost, I mean, I think that they're in the several hundreds of dollars to up to fifteen thousand dollars. What was the most? Was it BOD the most expensive one? For the nitrogen, I think you. And the ones that we were using, as far as uh, deployable, I think they're uh, easily installable to any permanent structure or to any mounted structure. It can probably mount on a variety of different surfaces. So, uh, if you have a means of putting in some type of post or structure at a, at a critical point within a cranberry bog, there shouldn't be any reason why you couldn't use one of these. In fact, I think they do use them for a variety of water quality applications. It's not just wastewater at, at a treatment plant per se. Sure. So in terms of deploying nitrate sensors in cranberry bogs, the issue you run up, up, up against is the detection limit. So the detection limit generally is well sufficient for some place like a treatment plant, but for the environment, the detection limit isn't good enough to get you um, what you need to measure. So what are the auto, so the um, current meters will be automated continuous. The samplers are take point samples, but they're on, you know, it's a carousel with 20, 20 bottles and it can take splits every, you know, 10 minutes. So samples that are automated. Yes. Yes. Um, two questions, actually. Um, I have very fond memories of lobstering with my grandfather when I was a little boy. I think the first time I was ever on a boat, I was about four years old on his lobster boat. And lobsters were plentiful. Um, they're not today. Um, they seem to have almost disappeared from Buzzards Bay. And I'm wondering, is that a nitrogen problem, a bacterial problem, or, or something else? So that's one question. The other question is, I've got a friend who lives on Little Bay in Fairhaven, looking across um, at Mattapoisett, with a beautiful salt marsh in front of his house that is disappearing at 10 to 20 feet a year. And I'm wondering why. Is that also due to nitrogen pollution or, or something else? Uh, in terms of the lobsters, the general feeling is that uh, it's a water temperature issue. There is a shell disease um, that, that affects lobsters and uh, water temperatures on the south side of New England ha and ha have been ri rising high enough that it, it's causing this disease to become more prevalent. Uh, the flip side of it is you're getting um, you know, uh, lobster further north in, in parts of Maine, uh, greater abundance up there. But in Buzzards Bay, it's mostly a temperature issue. I don't have a good answer for the Little Bay question. I, so uh, one of these Massachusetts Estuaries Project reports has been done for Little Bay, and actually the, the research there has showed that the Little Bay is in pretty good, pretty good shape, that it needs to maintain, the, that it can't handle more nitrogen, but that the existing level should be right about where, where it is. So, um, so I don't know if it's the, I don't, that's the best answer I have. possibilities for so yeah. much die off. Thanks. I was wondering in West Falmouth whether you, uh, there was any discussion of the small um, uh, decentralized plants where you tie in a handful of homes into uh, one of the uh, you know, more modern treatment plants and uh, be able to handle the problem that way. Uh, we've, we've talked about a lot of these things. And, and when, once again, you, you find there's a whole lot of talk and not too many examples of where it's actually been done cost effectively. Um, so we, uh, we, we didn't go there. I, I think the, pre the premise here is that the, these 20, and, and probably more, but these 20 are certainly contributing all their nitrogen to the harbor. <laughs> it's not being attenuated on the way. The ones that have cesspools, it's going straight in without any in interference at all. Uh, so we're, we're counting on getting two things out of this. One is research results and knowledge about what works and how much it costs. The other is we're going to clean up 20 major individual homes that are contributing as much nitrogen as a home can contribute to that harbor. 
So, so there's a two pieces to this. The, the idea of actually trying to install a sewer down there, uh, it, it was just not cost effective. Uh, the houses aren't that close together. Uh, the distance to where you'd have to take it to treat it would be uphill and far. And we'd be taking it to the plant that we're just spending all this money to, uh, <laughs> to uh, re ameliorate. Uh, so, so for a lot of reasons, it, 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 it didn't go there. I'm just uh, going to say that I promised the Whaling Museum we'd be out of here by 8 o'clock. It's always good to finish before people start getting too wiggly. So maybe one or two questions more. I've got, got a question here. I'm wondering about those 15 options. Is there a way that a uh, layman can learn more about the individuals and also learn about the results? See you. A hard question for you. Um, we're going to absolutely have a report that comes out of this project. It's actually a very exciting project. I, I think we're going to learn a lot about these um, on-site systems. Um, so uh, it's, it's a grant funded through the National Estuaries Project, so hopefully it'll be a report that becomes available to the public and is online as uh, part of the body of research on, on these kinds of systems. Uh, and, and in terms of understanding the systems, we'll have an interim report where we've got a matrix that Look, list each system and all kinds of sort of critical information about them, and that'll be in the report. Um, and we're also coming up with a, 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 what we're calling a decision support tool that helps people rank their own priorities for installation. So an aesthetic priority over a first cost versus a 20-year present worth cost. And so you'll be able to see how the different systems rank with different kinds of priorities. And the, uh, so the alternative test center, there's an alternative septic system test center. Have you heard of that? It's um, through the Barnstable County Department of Health and Environment, and it's online. And what the center has done, and George Hoyfelder in particular, who's on our um, working group, every innovative alternative septic system on Cape Cod is in that database, and that database is online. So you can go in for every town on the Cape and look at every single type of you know, IA system and what the nitrogen numbers are. All of our systems are then going to be on that website. And so if you Google uh, alternative test center in Massachusetts, you'll be able to get there. And we'll put the link on our, in our paper, I think, because I think it's important. Thanks. Well, how much would it cost to Bedford to fix its, its uh, storm drain uh, sewage mixing problem? Um, the CSO problem is a really, really tough one because of the elevation of the pipes. Um, I've heard it talked about on the order of maybe 300 or 400 million dollars. Uh, part of the solution that was proposed originally is to build basically a giant hollow pipe down the center of uh, Clark's Point and basically it would act as storage because the problem is there's no place to put the storm water. So that's a very expensive solution. It would be more expensive than the original sewage treatment plant upgrade and it would require a lot of federal money. Thank you to the speakers. It was really interesting. Thank you.